up, everybody? This is Dr. Regina Bradley, and this is Outcasted Conversations number 14. I don't even have to be tell you that I'm crunk. We got the one and only Mr. Brad Kamikaze Franklin from Crooked Letters. What's going on, good sir? What's happening, good doctor? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm ready to get this conversation started. It's, it's always dope to talk to folks who were in the game around the same time as, as you know, showing that the South got something to say. So, you know how you got to get into this club? How did you become no outcasted? Um, basically, I became an outcast. I mean, I was an outcast fan the moment that I heard Players Ball. Um, and I'm going to tell you, like, just to give the history and give the context of what Cats in Mississippi were kind of dealing with and what we were going through, um, New York hip-hop and East Coast hip-hop was all that we had to identify with. You know, that was it. So we grew up, unfortunately, and I always say, tell people how embarrassed I am to really admit this, but, you know, we were cats down here. We were walking around with Timberland boots on, you know what I'm saying, one jeans, pants, leg rolled up. <laughs> wearing, uh, you know, wearing hoodies. We were going around calling each other kid and son, and we were trying to sound as New York as we could possibly sound. And we identified, like, my crew, the whole Storeways crew from which me and Banner came from, our whole crew was really like a real lyrical East Coast-oriented type of crew. Mm. So <clears throat> we spent the better part of our formative years getting into this game trying to identify with New York because as Southern artists, we didn't have anybody to identify with. So you naturally identify with people that you see. So the people that we were seeing at the time, you know, was, you know, Wu-Tang, you know, Nas, you know, Third Base, um, Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, you know, those were the people that we identified with. We identified heavily with East Coast artists because we had nobody to identify with. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like in the same fashion when you talk about young black boys, not having black men as role models to look at, you know what I'm saying, in that neighborhood. So we didn't see anybody. So for for me, when I first saw Players Ball, that was my first time actually seeing someone who looked like me doing what we did, uh, talking about what we did in the South, and that was the first time that I had to really identify with it. And um, I tell everybody for me, my epiphany, in my moment where, you know, I had my moment of clarity was watching Andre 3000 on the Source Awards when he went to the mic and he said, the South's got something to say. Uh, and for a lot of people, that was a pivotal moment. But for me, that was the moment that I was unshackled by the oppression, quote unquote, as it were, of identifying with simply East Coast music. Um, at that moment, I realized that I could be proudly Southern that I could be from the South, that I could be from Mississippi and represent where I'm from and tell my stories and be accepted in this grand pantheon that we call hip-hop today. So for me, that was almost a spiritual moment, you know, to watch those guys go up on stage, to watch them be booed, uh, you know, and all of us in Mississippi sitting in front of our TV being glued to the Source Awards because for us the Source was our Bible at the time. So being glued to those awards and watching that, and watching him get booed and watching him stand up in the face of that and say what he had to say proved to us that we could just be us. And from that moment on, I completely discarded all of the things that I was doing to try to act like I was East Coast. Yeah, so for, so for me, you know, that was my moment of clarity and that was the moment that I knew at that time that, you know what I'm saying, I could be who I was. Mm-hmm. That I could be who I was and, you know, still make it in this game and still be accepted as an MC. So that's how I kind of got turned on to Outkast. Uh, right after I graduated, I was working for the Associated Press in Atlanta. And I was in Atlanta for a year. And I was actually there and able to see the movement when AT Aliens was about to drop and actually ran into Dre and Big Boy and the whole Dungeon Family crew out passing out CDs, passing out not CDs, I'm sorry, passing out cassette samplers for the AT Aliens and, you know, got a chance to watch them and watch their grind, got a chance to actually go to some shows while I was there. So I was actually in Atlanta when this thing was actually taking place and jumping off. So that kind of connected it to me even more. So uh, that's kind of how I got outcasted. And, you know, to me, you know, you can call me a stan or whatever you want to call it, but I think outcast is absolutely the greatest hip-hop group of all time. I think the body of work 
uh, you know, basically, you know what I'm saying, determines that. I think that's dope. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you, you know, you being from Mississippi, Mississippi isn't exactly considered to be, you know, an urban southern space, right? Um, what are some of the ways that, you know, the depiction of the South and outcast music didn't resonate with you being from Mississippi? Okay, I couldn't hear the last question. Speak up a little bit. No, I was saying, you know, Outcast talks about like this urban southern space like Atlanta and stuff like that, but Mississippi isn't exactly considered to be an urban space. So were there any aspects of their southernness that didn't resonate with you? Um, absolutely not. I mean, I think their experience was our experience. A lot of people, you know, for me when I was there at that time, you know, a lot of people don't understand how Atlanta really did not become the Atlanta that it is until after the Olympics came. Right. Uh, right. And that was a very pivotal part for that city because, you know, the Olympics pumped the kind of money that cities need pumped into their city. You know, when you have that world stage and people are coming into your city, you know, that's a lot of money coming in. It's a lot of tourist dollars, a lot of people coming in and seeing your city. You put your best foot forward naturally, of course. And we can talk about all the things that Atlanta tried to do, you know, to hide black folks around that time as people were coming into their city. Um, and I see Jackson as being in the same place. I see Mississippi as being in the same place as Atlanta was in 96 right mm -hmm. now. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of a lot of big things. So it's an urban city that has some very unique country features to it is what I call it. So, um, you know, I think we're kind of in the same place. And I think the movement that we're doing here musically is something that's going to help to turn Jackson into the next Atlanta. And there are a lot of artists here that are, you know what I'm saying, making strides to make that happen. So there's a lot of similarities between between what Outkast was doing there and what Crooked Letters ended up doing here in Mississippi. There's a lot of similarities there. I think, you know, the time frame is just taking a little bit longer. But, you know, I would describe it, you know, solely as an urban city with a lot of country sensibilities. So, I mean, that, that's how I'd look at it. So let's talk about you and, and Crooked Letters for a second. I mean, y'all are some pioneers in hip-hop also, you know what I'm saying? Um, what, what are some of the ways that, you know, Crooked Letters changed how we understand Southern hip-hop? You know what I'm saying? Like, how does it, how did it, how do you guys consider your music really changing the landscape in terms of what we understand Southern hip-hop to look and sound like? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. When we were recording that album and when we got together and did what we were doing, we wouldn't we weren't looking at a big picture um we we wasn't looking at um we didn't know that the impact that we made would still be in effect right now we were just two dudes fresh out of college uh had no idea about the industry still wet behind the ears industry wise who loved hip hop and in us loving hip hop uh, what we did was put together something that has resonated with people from our state and luckily with people that are from the South. So, you know, we were just going in and we were doing what we love to do. We were just going in and doing music. So, you know what I'm saying? Um, for us, ultimately, um, it turned out good and it turned out into a lasting piece of work. But when you go in just doing what you love doing, when you go in doing that, then you always get the best results. And I find that for us, you know, as we've gone on and done other things, that was probably our best, most cohesive piece of work between both of us as, as solo artists because of the fact there were no expectations, there were no limitations, and we were just going in doing what we love to do without the trappings of the business, without the industry, without any of their own. So I'm really glad at the end of the day that Crooked Letters was able to make the impact that it was. You know, this year being the 15th anniversary of Grey Skies, and uh, we're celebrating that this year. We're just lucky to have something that people still come up to us and say, you know, that was the soundtrack, you know what I'm saying, to, you know, my high school years, or that was the soundtrack to my college years, or you guys – uh, you know, made me be proud to say that I was from Mississippi or I was in another part of the country and they were talking about all the artists that come from their city or their state and I was able to say that, you know, David Banner and Kamikaze is from Mississippi and look in the source and look at Unsigned Hype and look at Double XL and look on MTV and these guys are doing their thing. So I was just glad to be a part of that. And, you know, to have Outkast kind of set that precedent, you know, they made it possible for us 
to get our deal. They made it possible for us to do what it is that we did. So, you know, we're going to always be thankful for that. And, you know, just in that alone, it's another reason why Outcast was so important, just simply because they paved the way. Uh, and we still ended up getting with a label that had no idea what to do with us as Southern artists. Uh, it was an East Coast label. But at the very least, Outcast made people stand up and take notice and say, hey, you know, these cats down south are really doing something that we really need to try to be a part of. They made their best efforts at it. But I, I think not until Master P and Cash Money kind of really showed the independent model did the South really actually get its due monetarily uh, and, and in popularity. And I think before then, there's a lot of artists, you know, like us, like Jadis out of Atlanta that Soul Messiah used to uh, to, to uh, do some work with, uh, Odd Squad. Uh, it's a lot of groups in the South that did not get their just due on a national scale because labels just absolutely had no idea what to do with Southern artists. Wow. Uh, real quick Southern Hip Hop 101 lesson right there. I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but when you were talking, though, I know that you're very active in Jackson, the community politically and, and culturally and stuff like that. Um, it makes me think about the ways that Southern Hip Hop, one of the foundations for Southern Hip Hop was there's a form of activism, even if it was just like a cultural representation. You know what I'm saying? So, right. um, you know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the ways that your music and outcast music kind of gave us a new way to think about activism in the South after the Civil Rights Movement. Um, Chuck D said it best. Chuck D said that hip-hop was the CNN of the streets. Uh, and that's no different for the South. Uh, when you're talking about cats who are basically telling you what's happening in our neck of the woods, um, the Ghetto Boys is instrumental in that. You pick up, you know, those first Ghetto Boys records, and they were basically telling you what was going on in Fifth Ward, Houston. Uh, Outcast on Southern Playlist of Cadillac Music basically gave you a blueprint for what Cats did in Atlanta. All the way down to the fact, like, people not realizing that Players Ball was a Christmas song. And that Players Ball was first introduced on a So So Deaf Christmas album. And there's sleigh bells in the song, and they're basically telling you, this is what we do during Christmas. But the song was so dope, people lost that whole thing in the song. And they were basically telling you, this is what we do down south. You guys do this. This is what we do. This is what's happening in your neck of the woods, but this is what's happening down here in the south. We are still, by and large, an oppressed people because there are vestiges that still take place in the south that, you know what I'm saying, we are still encumbered by. There are vestiges that are still here that, you know, we still have to deal with every day. And that's something that, that Outkast talked about, and it's something that the Ghetto Boys talked about, too, at the same time. So what we tried to do and what we did when we sat down and made Gray Skies is that we talked about what was going on in Mississippi. You know, we talked about what we had to deal with in Mississippi, which kind of is a common theme throughout the South of what, you know, black men and women have to deal with. And, uh, you know, sadly, in a lot of instances, a lot of our Southern artists have kind of departed from that and it's turned into something else. But, you know, for us, you know, and for me particularly, it's always been a means for us to, you know, talk about the things that are going on, you know, in the South. Uh, racism, whether it be politically, whether it be economically, the fights that we are still having here. Uh, you know, music is that medium for us to get that out. The things that we have going on here are just simply different than there are in other places. Mm -hmm. We have different things happening. Uh, we're handling them in different ways. And in a sense, a lot of our white folk and black folk are not as nuanced as people are in other areas. So those vestiges that you have seen put in place uh, in the South historically, you know, we're still fighting against a lot of those. And a lot of our people in other areas of the country, in the West Coast and the East Coast, don't see that so they don't understand it. And, you know, of course, people, you know, dismiss what they don't understand. That's why you still get people who think that Mississippi has gravel roads. Uh, you still have people that have their perception of Mississippi when they come down here and their perception of the South. And all we tried to do through our music was was try to change that perception. And I think Outkast did a good job. The Dungeon family as a whole did a good job to change that perception, not just socially, but also musically, you know what I'm saying, to show those cats on the East Coast who were so staunch in holding on to the fact that we created this and nobody else can do it as good as we do it, they prove that musically we can be as creative and on par as anybody that is doing this. And for us, you know, we call Mississippi Little Africa because we feel like Mississippi is the birthplace of black people in this country. It's the birthplace, birthplace of black music in this country. So 
nothing new under the sun. What you know, Cool Herc and those people were able to do in those boroughs in Brooklyn, you know, that was music that they got from the forefathers that migrated to those areas from the south. They got that from us. The mm-hmm. spirituals, the blues, rock and roll, all of those things they got from the South can all be traced back almost to the mythical crossroads that Robert Johnson stood at. So, you know, when you talk about that, they get that style from us. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, at the end of the day, we can say that we created hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Us and, you know what I'm saying, those people that were not indigenous to this country or indigenous to that part of the of, of America that took that music and, and brought it up there. You know what I'm saying? What Cool Herc brought from the islands, that was not something that was, you know what I'm saying, germane to New York. He brought that there, and he made hip-hop and created hip-hop from that. So, you know, it's a tool. Uh, we have, you know, we have different challenges here. That's what I just tell people. We have different challenges here that other people have, and we have the opportunity as artists to kind of talk about that. So that's that's really what we try to do at the end of the day, and, and that's what I continue to try to do and what Banner is doing and, uh, you know, what I would love for Outkast to do, but alas, it doesn't look like, you know, they're going to be able to get their stuff together to do another record. But, you know, we'll take what we can get in small bits and pieces in tours and whatnot. <laughs> Yo, so I want to end the conversation kind of where we started. So, um, 95, Dre said the South got something to say. It's 2014. You know what I'm saying? Does the South still have something to say in hip hop? I mean, you got Crit releasing Mount Olympus that just destroyed folks. Um, so, you know, does the South still have something to say in hip hop? We, we do still have something to say. And unfortunately, we are still much maligned. Uh, MCs in the South, and I'm not talking about rappers and artists because I consider them to be two different categories. Mm -hmm. MCs in the South still do not get their just due uh, in in hip hop as much as other MCs from other areas do. Uh, You know, Kendrick Lamar dropped a verse on control. Right. The internet went absolutely nuts. It broke. The internet broke into pieces when he dropped that verse. Crit drops an entire song. Completely crushing the game. The internet talks about it for a day. Oh no! Maybe. I'm still talking about it. That shit was the. We're we're talking about it because you know we understand what's going on. But I don't see the same. I don't see the same fervor that I saw when Kendrick dropped his verse. I never see the same craziness go on when you have Southern MCs that drop dope verses. When 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 Face just dropped his new record. You know, the internet, you know, was a buzz for about a day. Then it kind of died down. Uh, we don't get our just due. People don't look at people like Andre 3000 and Scarface as they do Nas and Jay-Z. They just don't. And you can, talk about, you, can, you can talk about the body of work that those people have put together, but still at the end of the day, when we talk about those being two of our dopest MCs of all time, they don't get the just due and the press that Nas and Jay-Z do. Elliot Wilson heard Mount Olympus, and his response was, it's a good rap song. So when I saw that, and, so when I saw that and knowing what his reaction was when the control verse dropped, you know what I'm saying, there is a bias that exists. There is a media bias that exists against Southern MCs, and we have to be twice as good just to get half as far. So to answer your question, yes, we still have something to say, and we need to be as aggressive about it as we possibly can because if we're not, we're going to continue to get left, uh, you know, we're going to continue to get overlooked when people, you know, start, you know, talking about, you know, Southern MCs. You know, they talk about Ross, they talk about, you know, Lil Wayne, uh, and that's kind of it in the grand scheme. Crit doesn't get his just due. Andre 3000 still didn't get his just due. I don't think Faith gets his just due. Crooked Letters never got their just due, in my opinion, and there's a lot of MCs out there that I feel like just basically have not gotten their just due, and it's a bias that exists. Uh, And I think it's a media bias that exists, not just for Southern MCs, but for the South, period. You know, when things go on down here, whether it be music or social justice issues, we just don't get that shine. But if it's something negative, you know, of course, it's going to be plastered all over CNN. So that's just something that the South has to deal with, you know, period. But, you know, yeah, we do have something to say. 
we need to be very aggressive about saying it. We need to make sure that people hear it. And if we have to be three times as good to get half as far, that's what we're going to continue to have to do. All it does is just makes us better at what we do. You know, and the next generation of cats that I'm seeing come up now, you know, they are, you know, stepping up to the plate and they're doing what needs to be done for us to continue doing that. So much love to Crit, you know, Tito Lopez. Uh, you know, cats like that that are doing it out of Mississippi. Uh, you know, Banner's dropping a new record. I'm getting ready to drop a new record. So, you know, celebrating 15 years of great skies, man, is just for us, like, just uh, another, you know, another, you know, uh, another part of the movement, you know, for us to mature and turn into grown-up hip-hop artists, you know what I'm saying, to keep putting on for the South. So, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, it does. And to bring it back full circle, Outkast had a lot to do with that. We patterned ourselves a lot, you know, we really kind of called ourselves a hybrid uh, and a cross between Outkast and UGK is what Crooked Letters was. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's what kind of shaped, you know, the cast that we were. That's why we were able to do songs like A Girl Named Kim and Tupelo, but also do Get Crunk and Firewater because, you know, we were kind of like the hybrid sons of, of, of Pimp C and Andre 3000 and Big Boy and Bun B, you know, all together. And because we are located in the center of everything, because Mississippi is the crossroads of the South, you know, I-20 and I-55 intersecting everything, and we're right in the middle of it, we get, you know, a, a lot of their aura and a lot of their spirit, you know, comes through us, you know, and that's kind of what we put out in those records, man. So Outkast had a, had a lot to do with that. Mr. Franklin, how can folks holler at you, what you got going on, and, and tell the people all that good stuff? <laughs> Cool, cool. Uh, the new EP, My Strange Addiction, is about to drop. It's going to be my first project in like three years. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter, at Kamikaze601. It's at K-A-M-I-K-A-Z-E-601. Or you can hit me up on Instagram, at Mr. Franklin 601 I'm pretty sure y'all could probably spell that. Hit me up. You know what I'm saying? I'm always posting uh, random uh, thoughts and, and statuses, and sometimes it's foolishness, and sometimes it's not. You know, we can we can laugh and build together. So hit me up. Uh, you know, I'm always looking to build with people and talk to people. Uh, always looking to uh, connect with folks that want to hear new music and hear good music and talk about Mississippi in and of itself. So at Kamikaze601 on Twitter, IG, at Mr. Franklin 601 Hit me up. And uh, shouts out to you for doing what you're doing. And I am honored to have been asked to do these conversations and uh, following in, in, in uh, Kise's and, and Charlie's footsteps and doing these conversations. I feel like now that I've made it, and I can almost just retire now. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So, I'm Dr. Regina Bradley. This is Outcast of Conversations. We'll holler at y'all next week. Y'all be easy.